Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is kind of coming from primarily an applied math perspective and looking at, um, I guess, using tools and ideas from dynamical systems uh, in the hope of understanding and analyzing a real world problem um, and, and a real world ecological problem. So um, as the title suggests, I'm looking or we were looking at scavenging communities and the, the real reason for this is uh, due to the presence of vultures. So to start off with, uh, what I've showed here taken uh, from a recent review paper is uh, a map looking at the distribution of so-called old world vultures or chips vultures. And so what you can hopefully see on this map here is that uh, these birds have a wide distribution. So across Africa, Eurasia, kind of locally here on the left, quite a lot of uh, vultures in Spain. Uh, but perhaps more pressingly that this heat map uh, showing conservation priority indicates that where you have quite a lot of red, vultures aren't doing very well. And there is quite a lot of red there. Um, and the reason for this is primarily due to interactions with humans, unfortunately. So uh, poisoning, be it deliberate or, or accidental, has taken vulture numbers um, much lower than they otherwise would have been. A lot of in, um, collisions with power lines, habitat degradation, generally uh, declines have been noted across this range um, and it's it's become a kind of situation of, of critical concern for conservationists. Um, and the reason that we particularly care other than just for the sake of, kind of keeping our planet the way it originally had been as much as possible, the reason from kind of services point of view that we're particularly interested in vultures is that they uh, tend to clean up ecosystems. So vultures and in this case gyps vultures are apex and obligate scavengers. So that means that they tend to dominate the scavenging communities in which they are found and they're obligate scavengers, which means that they can only eat dead animal biomass. So or carrion, carrion or carcasses uh, is the only food source that they're capable of dealing with and they deal with it very, very well. Uh, and, and for that reason, they're very efficient and they tend to, to do this kind of cleaning service, as I mentioned. Um, and so uh, a part of this then is kind of figuring out, first of all, what can we do to uh, protect vultures? And that's kind of a, a kind of conservation angle. But then also what will happen um, while these systems have been kind of pushed far from what we consider their sort of default or sort of maybe natural configuration would be. And so um, an important aspect of this is that vultures tend to live a long time so that if you're looking at a vulture recovery process, you could be waiting quite a while before these ecosystems, these communities, these populations return towards what we would consider to be or hope to be healthy. Um, but right now, vultures are endangered and that has tended to imply um, that there is a phenomenon happening in many of these um, parts of the old world called meso scavenger release. Uh, a meso scavenger as opposed to an apex scavenger typically is an animal or a bird that can eat carrion but doesn't exclusively rely upon it and so it tends not to be as good as an apex scavenger like a vulture or a, say a Tasmanian devil in another part of the world would be uh, but they are opportunist and if you remove a very dominant competitor like a vulture population, they will tend to intervene and, and start, um, I guess, changing the ecosystem in their own image. Um, so from there, then we kind of move on to this idea of meso scavenger release more generally. And so um, we've been working on this, I guess, for a number of years, kind of on and off as kind of our schedules allowed. Uh, and kind of while we're in the process of sort of I guess planning planning a kind of line of attack, figuring out what we could do that would kind of help to understand this problem, uh, the supply problem. A really interesting paper uh, was published in Ecology Letters, uh, high impact factor ecology journal. And so this one by O'Brien et al looks at the kind of empirical and theoretical um, evidence behind this so-called meso scavenger release. And so they also looked at it from the point of view 
of what I have here as um, ecosystem and human well-being. So human well-being uh, is maybe an aspect that you wouldn't immediately think of here. But in many cases, for example, in India, if you remove or when you have removed the vulture population, that leads to a rise in a feral dog population. They suddenly have much more food than they previously um, would have been lucky enough to encounter. And that has led to or it's believed that this has led to further outbreaks in rabies than you otherwise would have expected to see. Uh, so this has kind of been studied in, in the past couple of decades and that the kind of there appears to be this kind of causal link between the removal of vultures um, through kind of inadvertent poisoning uh, and then this kind of rise in in cases of rabies in the, the local human pop dog and then human population. Um, and so the, the kind of evidence is gathering. This is quite a recent paper um, and it's sort of building in a way on a kind of previous older idea of meso predator release where the kind of parallel is you remove an apex predator from a system and you see a release of kind of smaller previously subordinate meso predators and this has now been extended towards apex scavengers in this case vultures leading to uh, a rise of meso scavengers and from a theoretical point of view the major contribution here that i've highlighted this is my island is that um the the authors provided a model so a mathematical model of scavenger dynamics and they demonstrated that this hypothesis is consistent with ecological theory so a, a way of doing this um is essentially that you uh, through the kind of levers you have in your mechanistic model you hold the vulture population in a kind of low level state for example by saying they have a permanently altered mortality rate and it's much much higher than you would expect in a kind of unaltered or pristine or natural system and when you do this you uh, by modeling an interaction and uh, uh, exploitative interaction so you have a another faculty of scavenger in the system you see that when you remove a vulture you release uh, a kind of surplus of dead biomass in the system and that allows the kind of secondary scavenger population to get more food which you can then channel into increased reproduction and you ultimately see more meso scavengers uh, than you had when the kind of system had been left to its own devices um, and so what kind of hadn't been done here um, at this point is a sort of a look at what will actually happen um, essentially in the aftermath of let's say a large-scale poisoning so if you have temporarily uh, in a kind of episodic fashion harmed the vulture population so you've just wiped out a, a large percentage of what was there um, how does the system rearrange and ultimately hopefully recover uh, and kind of what happens along the way. So the kind of uh, sort of time dependent problem um, uh, to kind of put it another way. And so this is kind of where we kind of wanted to take this kind of mechanistic modeling strand uh, in applying it to this kind of meso scavenger release hypothesis. And so um, to, to, to start with then, we have this schematic of what this kind of model looks like. So this is adapted from the O'Brien paper from a couple of years ago. And how this typically works, um, so we're going to move on to how this looks in a kind of differential equation context uh, in a few minutes. But effectively, you have um, a minimum of three different compartments or populations. So in order to kind of get at this functionality that you want, you need to have uh, kind of a vulture population, at least one meso scavenger. It, it could be a mammal or it could be a, a bird, uh, but at least one other population that doesn't solely rely on the presence of carrion as a food source. And explicitly, you need to have some way of counting and um, a kind of budget of the the food in the system. So this this third pool over here is is dead biomass, which obviously is is being supplied through the death of a live animal population in that area or in that habitat. And so these um, these arrows here indicate kind of fluxes in the system effectively so that you have scavenging on the bottom here, which takes this this biomass, this food source uh, and um, removes it through the interaction with the scavenging population as you'd expect. 
Uh, you also then have carcass decay in the top right. That's the other way that um, this, this food supply can be removed. So effectively, you have something else in the system that removes the carcasses. And that could be something that you don't wish to model. It could be something like invertebrates, so insects. It could be microbes. It could be kind of a collection of all of these things. But it, it effectively, it represents a certain amount of food that's not available to the, the scavengers that we've modeled. So the vultures, the, the mammals, whatever else. Uh, and then beyond that, if you look at the kind of the populations themselves, you have mortality of the vulture population. That will just be a way of um, limiting its numbers. Uh, and that can happen generally just through old age or, or freak events, or I guess, depending on how you set your model up, that could be poisoning too. Uh, and then uh, in a slightly different fashion, you uh, model the dynamics of the meso scavenger population or populations, depending on, on what kind of level of detail you require. And so this might be kind of considered a, a slightly controversial way of doing it, but it's it's a kind of extension of the way that the meso predator models have been looked at. You don't really know or want to consider what the meso scavengers are doing when they're not eating the dead biomass. So they they're often going to be predators or, or omnivores. They're going to be eating something else, but um, you may not really be able to account for that, or you may just want to limit the complexity of your model. So a way around that is simply saying that if you don't have any carrion or dead biomass, you'll have just a logistic growth equation. So you define some kind of carrying capacity that's not a sort of true carrying capacity, but it's sort of a stand-in or a proxy, and that tells you what that mesoscavenger population will do when it doesn't get the benefit of this um, this kind of extra food opportunity. Um, OK, so then what we wanted to do was to take this framework to apply it to a vulture population and to keep in mind that as of now, there is an action plan, an international action plan in place um, that hopes to limit the damage in the future to vulture populations. So the idea is, uh, make the policy changes that are required to prevent any further kind of unnatural disturbances to the vulture population. So the idea is, if we think that now it's kind of time zero, vulture populations are worryingly low, as this heat map shows, but we're going to kind of prevent any further damage to the best of our ability. Uh, and now let's see what happens. So that is presumed to involve a certain amount of meso scavenger release, but the idea is that if we don't uh, damage the vulture population any further in a deterministic model and hopefully in reality you will see the vulture population gradually recover over some as yet unknown time scale and so you kind of have a, you hopefully have a kind of predictive framework in which you can look at these kind of long recovery time scales in a way that wouldn't be very easy to do or even possible to do in a kind of uh, empirical or, or field experiment setting. Uh, so to do that, we we essentially needed to pick one, uh, I guess, ideal ecosystem in which to focus and essentially parameterize a model uh, with that ecosystem in mind. And the hope then is that if we understand that well enough, we can kind of transfer our predictions to other similar ecosystems. So what we did then, largely due to or dictated by the availability of data is we looked at Kruger National Park, which is uh, usually considered a pristine ecosystem or otherwise pristine ecosystem in the northern part of South Africa. So I'm not sure if you can see my, my mouse here, but somewhere over here, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, is where Kruger uh, sits. And so to actually uh, use this as our kind of uh, case study, we needed to figure out uh, essentially, we need to figure out what is the scavenging community there in order to figure out whether and how meso scavenger release happens and, um, uh, and the kind of ramifications of that. So to do that, we essentially consulted the literature that exists uh, and reasonably rich literature that exists on African carnivores. And that was one source. The second source of information we had was the biodiversity statistics that are available online for Kruger National Park. And essentially, if you combine those two sources, you know 
which African carnivores scavenge and you know which African carnivores are in this um, smaller ecosystem, you, you essentially figure out which species are on both of those lists and that's your kind of suggested scavenging community to start off with. So that's your kind of inputs to this uh, population modeling framework. And so um, we did that essentially, and I've taken the kind of the list of African scavengers from um, a chapter of a book by Jones et al. And I've uh, removed the kind of irrelevant or, or absent species. And kind of, I guess, to our relief, it's not a very long list. Uh, so it kind of naturally puts a kind of ceiling on how complex our model needed to be. And so what we were left with is lions, hyenas, two kinds of jackal species and um, uh, a largely a vulture kind of guild of vultures that's dominated by a species called white-backed vultures. And so this book told us that all of these species have been observed to have a, propor a positive proportion of their diet obtained from scavenging. And there's quite a wide uncertainty associated with this in some cases. For example, with spotted hyenas, uh, depending on where you look, you can have 5% of their diet coming from scavenging up to 99% of their diet. So effectively the entire diet coming from scavenging. Um, so it's, you know, the, you, you kind of have an idea that hyenas are going to scavenge, but it's kind of hard to tell and it could be quite system dependent. Uh, for whiteback vultures, then, for example, you have 100% of the diet coming from scavenging, kind of trivially true because as we kind of saw earlier, that's the only thing they can do, that that is their diet, that they can't prey on any on any live animals. And then for lions and jackals, you have a slightly narrower range of, um, of percentages there, but it is still kind of reasonably unclear how much of, of their diet is going to come from, from dead biomass. Uh, but this kind of gives us an input to our model. This, this means we, we have something to build. And so this means that uh, when you for our purposes, um, it was convenient to combine these two jackal species into one kind of uh, population abundance, one variable that we keep track of because their ecologies are, are very similar. So if you combine these two jackals, uh, you add lions, you add hyenas, you add vultures, you're left with four different scavenging populations. And when combined with your uh, carcass abundance, you end up with five ordinary differential equations, and that is that is your mathematical model. So this, this is in line with the schematic I showed earlier, so I kind of won't dwell on it too long. I guess the main point here is that we have five variables, V, J, H, L, and C, uh, H, L, and C, and that's vultures, jackals, hyenas, lions, and carrion. And so the three mammal populations, as I said, have one component that's a logistic equation and one component that is uptake of carcasses and conversion using these Y parameters into new mammals, basically. Um, so these uptakes are, are what's are given by what's known as a functional response. And this is the kind of the, the standard first try that you generally use in these kind of models. So um, it's, it's a nonlinear functional response, sometimes called Holling type two functional response. And we can, we'll look at how this um, We'll, we'll kind of look at some plots of these uh, quite soon, but the general idea is that you have a discovery rate and you have a handling time, so you have two parameters per uptake function. Uh, and that's generally seen as kind of enough detail to capture most of the essence of these kinds of interactions. Um, so you have four of these in the current equation. You then have a, a separate loss term, um, and that's due to just carcass decay that is probably going to be attributed to insects or microbes and a single uh, term remaining that's the carcass supply term and that's assumed to be the same every day you can to, to approximate this you can kind of look at longer time scales but in terms of the model it's a constant um, same amount every single day and then finally the vulture equation on top here again it said you have a mortality rate and you have uh, purely uptake of, of carrion and conversion of that into new vultures um, so in the end, you have five equations and uh, 20 parameters that you need to figure out a way to estimate. Um, and, and that's kind of quite a lot of the work really to this project is actually finding a way of being confident that you know these 20 parameters. 
And so two of these are, are just related to carrying dynamics. And we're able to estimate, for example, the current supply rate by again looking at the biodiversity statistics of Kruger National Park, figuring out which animals end up being eaten by scavengers. It's usually ungulates, hooved animals, stuff like elephants, zebras, wildebeest and so on. They all obviously are different sizes. When they die, they produce um, kind of pools of food of various sizes. And so we essentially got a list of all these animals and, and did a kind of actuarial approach of figuring out how many of how many of each is dying over the course of a year and then kind of go back to the smaller scale how many are dying on uh, a single day and so you're able to kind of um uh get reduce this complexity down to a single number which you can then compare to other ecosystems and there's kind of some kind of ground truthing you can do so that you're sort of fairly confident that you're right at least to at least to an order of magnitude if not better uh, for uptake, then you have, again, there's eight of these because you have four different scavenger populations. You've discovery times, which you can usually estimate by uh, figuring out the sort of movement of an average animal and, and how good their eyesight or smell is. You can kind of use that to separate out um, the abilities of each um, mammal or vulture. Handling time, I'll talk a little bit about now. Um, that's a little bit more involved, the kind of estimation of this, but it's a really important part of the process. And then with reproduction, uh, you have the logistic terms for the mammals. So if nothing else, you kind of need to know what they've been doing historically. If they have no, uh, no carcasses to access, what do they do? What do they, how much prey do they eat? And, and how do they convert that into sustaining themselves? And conversion efficiencies, which are, um, again, much like, uh, so this is going to apply for both vultures and for mesoscavengers. scavengers. How do you convert biomass into new animals? Uh, so just as a kind of a uh, couple of examples here, handling times are um, are particularly important. And this basically says how long does it take for uh, a vulture or a mammal to eat uh, a unit? So let's say a kilogram of dead biomass. So I think I had a kind of more gruesome picture here and then thought the better of it. So this is not uh, maybe not immediately clear the relevance of this picture of a jackal watching hyenas eat for, for the handling time estimation. Um, the kind of the key point here is that all of the animals in our model, uh, partly because of, I guess, competition and, and selection, are very, very quick at sort of ripping apart the food that they encounter. So handling time comes in kind of two forms, the actual physical handling of the food you find and kind of kind of pulling it apart and eating it. And then also the digestion of it. So animals are, are kind of searching, they're eating, but they're not searching again necessarily until they're hungry. At least that's generally the way this kind of thing is um, incorporated into mathematical models. And so here we kind of um, were able to helpfully simplify the handling time. So we found that typically the butchering and ingestion was happening over the kind of time scale of minutes and the digestion was happening over hours. So we were able to kind of focus entirely on the digestion, look at uh, the kind of food requirements of an adult uh, and a, an adult and a young member of a population. And then we we realized we needed to combine these two things so that you generally model the adult populations in, in these kinds of uh, circumstances. But that if you have, for example, a couple of hyenas and they may have four dependents that uh, they also have to look out for, it isn't quite enough to say that these two hyenas have eaten enough for today, they will stop looking. They also need enough food to supply their, their young. And that's important both to get a sense of when do these animals stop eating and are kind of satiated, but also as a way of figuring out how to model the reproductive side uh, successfully. So that if you only have enough food for the adults, in reality, you're only going to be able to keep the adults alive. So you aren't going to be able to raise any newborns. So there is a kind of a, a switch over where when you have enough food, you can afford to add new members to the population. So um, effectively, we did a dive through data. Um, we, we kind of did this kind of, uh, I guess, derivation, and we were kind of able to incorporate this population structure in a way that 
that kind of made sense. And uh, at the end of that, you're able to look at what the functional response or the uptake rate is of each of these animal populations. And so um, apologies for the kind of rendering on the right here. There's some kind of um, gremlins that I didn't really notice in time to fix. Uh, so what you have here is color coded um, by species. And on the horizontal axis, you have essentially the amount of food, so the density of carrying in the system. On the vertical axis, you have the amount eaten by one individual of that species in a day. And so uh, this, these are hyperbolic functions. You see um, a kind of plateauing effect as you ramp up the amount of food that's available. And that's essentially where your handling time kicks in. You say, if I have enough food, uh, the amount I'll eat per day is the amount I can handle in a day. Whereas the food is very scarce so over here near um, the kind of zero density point, you are kind of essentially limited by how quickly you can find that scarce food. And so uh, there's kind of a lot going on here on the left. It's kind of a little bit hard for your eye to um, to unravel. But effectively, vultures, as you might expect, given that they can only eat carrion, they're much, much better at finding it. So even much steeper uh, slope here at low densities. Hyenas are kind of second, and that's kind of um, agreeing with observed data. Hyenas tend to be quite good at finding food. Um, and then lagging behind are the jackals and the lions. So this is kind of just coming from uh, deriving these parameters uh, in as kind of self-consistent a way as we could. Um, and, and so you kind of have these sorted effectively by how large the animal is. So um, the, the, the smaller bird population, the vultures, uh, don't require as much food for one individual to be full. So you have a much lower plateau here as compared to the mammals. And then the extreme here, uh, I kind of made the, the decision to cut the plot up here because the lions, uh, as a single lion, is able to eat quite a lot of meat in a day. So this, this guy kind of continues up here and eventually plateaus. Uh, and this is all on the assumption that they're able to find this carrying density. So you can kind of think of these as one individual in isolation, but in reality, we know that there are many such individuals and that they're competing against each other. So the kind of the amount of carrion that an individual uh, finds is going to change dependent on um, the, the sort of species that you put into your model. Um, and so uh, I should kind of speed up a little bit here, but uh, for parameterization, then the other kind of complexity that we, we found was in figuring out the conversion efficiencies. And so there is a kind of dearth of data on this. And in particular, because of the way it was kind of most appropriate for us to model. So we measured animal populations in terms of adult individuals, but carrion in terms of kilograms of meat. And so um, what your conversion efficiency effectively is doing is for every uh, piece of food that is taken in by a population, it's a kind of investment in a new animal in, in maybe four or five years from now. So because you have these kind of dependents that are sort of hanging around in the background, you may need to accumulate quite a lot of food in order to produce a new adult individual after maybe four years of being dependent on your parents. Uh, so this data, to the best of our knowledge, didn't really exist. So we needed a way to either um, compute it or, or do something else. So one approach is to kind of um, look at kind of feasible ranges for this and kind of choose these randomly. And that would lead you for this kind of four population uh, model into a place where you have quite a lot of uncertainty um, uh, that we weren't necessarily uh, looking to deal with. So the approach we took was to compute these, to use the kind of data that exists on these fairly charismatic species, uh, life history data and body size data and use that to infer what these efficiencies, efficiencies approximately should be. Uh, so in brief, then the, the, the assumptions we use to derive this are that um, these animals are essentially monogamous. So you can kind of look at a pair of vultures or a pair of lions and assume that they will stick together for their reproductive lifetime. That's a pretty good assumption for vultures and jackals, a little bit less so for hyenas and lions. But as long as it's kind of approximately true or the, the kind of um, sex structure of the population is, is near enough 50-50, you should do pretty okay with that, at least as a first, first approximation. Uh, 
And then we look at over the lifetime of this pair, how many new adults did they produce and how much food did they need to do it? So the food to maintain their own lives, bodies and the food they needed to produce uh, and sustain the dependents. Uh, and so you look at kind of a sequence of events over a long lifetime um, and then you kind of smear it together to fit into this sort of continuous time framework. Um, and, and when you do that, then you kind of are able to complete your model. Uh, the issue we had was that to actually figure out how much food um, that an offspring would need, especially for the mammals. So this data we found quite hard to come by. And so what we did was we looked at um, allometry. So essentially, if you have uh, this kind of general theory that as you increase the, the size of a carnivore, you can predict the consumption required per day uh, by following this kind of power law. So we took this curve uh, from Henschel and Til Tilson, a paper from the 1980s. Uh, for example, L1 and L2 over here on the right are observations of lions. I think the S's are spotted hyenas. So you're able to kind of pick this off. Um, and what we did was we got the weaning weights of the mammal populations. So we, in the absence of kind of data that we could find, we used this curve to approximate how much does a young jackal, a young lion and a young hyena need to survive and to grow. And that was kind of the last piece of the puzzle for us. We then had all 20 parameters and then finally we could actually solve our model. So we took um, we took uh, this five dimensional system. The first thing we did was we looked at long term behavior. So um, we found that helpfully there was one single or one stable equilibrium point. So um, in a deterministic system, everything is tending towards this kind of community configuration uh, for these 20 parameter values that we've estimated. And so this is um, maybe not very unexpected. Uh, you have the mammals essentially being excluded from the system, so they essentially go to the carrying capacity that you prescribed. And then for the vulture and carrion, uh, things are maybe a bit more interesting. You have the vulture population moving towards uh, approximately 10 adults per kilometer squared. And so this is extremely large um, compared to current estimates. So current estimates admittedly refer to kind of endangered populations, but also to historic estimates. We're not aware of uh, these African wide-backed vultures ever really being recorded um, or at least directly recorded ever attaining these kind of levels. Uh, and so that's quite interesting. That's kind of a, a nice output immediately in that it suggests that if in fact the it's the the lack of disturbances and the supply of food that's determining the, the potential of these populations, you're really, really, really far below um, your, your current potential at the moment, at least in Kruger National Park. Um, so it could be either that the disturbances have been going on much, much longer uh, than you would have expected, I guess, based on observation, or um, that you've missed something so that if you got up to maybe four adults per kilometer squared, some kind of overcrowding effect would kick in and it isn't just enough to have enough food. Something else is kind of regulating your population growth. Or um, it could be that it's kind of, I guess, um, correct and that you, you just haven't really ever given this older population enough chance to kind of uh, reach its full potential. So there have been uh, observations of a similar, uh, to pronounce this perfectly cinereous vulture species, uh, which has attained these kinds of levels. And so it is possible that, that the future is quite bright in that respect, if this kind of vulture population was left um, uh, to grow, to grow unhindered. And so in this setting, carrying density is remarkably low. So because you'd have so many vultures flying around, finding every bit of food that you add into the system, you're left with as a kind of standing stock, 40 kilograms in the entire national park. So it's basically one small animal kind of sitting at all times that the vultures for whatever reason just don't notice or, or aren't quite able to um, to extract. Uh, and so you've completely kind of hoovered up all possible food. Um, and so from there, then we kind of know the long term behavior based on determin determinism and, and 
there only being one stable equilibrium point. We want to look at what happens, uh, the kind of transient case. So what happens right after a poisoning? So if this is what happens in the recovery. What happens, say, right now, essentially? And so we took our model and we solved it numerically using MATLAB uh, in this case. And so on the left here, we have uh, the vulture population uh, in this panel A uh, growing uh, in time. So over a time span of about 50 years, you see the vulture population growing this kind of S shape, the sigmoid, up towards this upper limit of 10 adults per kilometer squared. Uh, so just growing monotonically and um, and uh, stopping when it runs out of food, basically. And so on the right, then, perhaps what's more interesting uh, right now is that you also see what happens to the mammal populations. So the jackals, the hyenas and the lions, particularly in these uh, first 10 or 15 years, do quite well. So uh, well, the jackals and the hyenas do quite well. The lions are essentially left out um, uh, as far as we can tell. So the jackals have a very quick spike followed by a decline. The hyenas have a slower increase um, followed by a much slower decline. And so um, this is kind of reflecting this meso scavenger release. So these mammals are getting a chance to exploit food that they otherwise wouldn't. They're growing above what we're saying their carrying capacity would have been in the absence of um, carrion, uh, but it doesn't last. Um, effectively, they're kicked back out of the system at about the same rate as they were able to join it. And so for completeness, we should also look here at the carrion dynamics. And this is on a log scale because it differed over kind of such orders of magnitude. So you see a, a, a spike very early on, and that's basically right away after we remove vultures. So we kind of say there wasn't very much carcasses, and then you start supplying it in without vultures there. It accumulates very, very, very quickly. It spikes, and then the kind of replacement scavengers start to work on it, and it eventually decreases to the the extremely low levels I mentioned at equilibrium. So after about 50 years, uh, even after about 30 years, it is quite low. Um, and that's due to, I guess, just the number of animals that are there taking advantage of it. It kind of suppresses the the suppresses the, the standing stock of uh, carcasses in the system. Um, and so uh, another way of looking at this is just in terms of the removal dynamics. So if you attribute the removal to one of these four species or the kind of generic carryall carcass decay rate, you see that over the years there's kind of a switch over in who's doing the eating effectively. So on the vertical axis you have the carcass removal in terms of kilograms per kilometer squared per day. And again the color code indicates that while at late times the vulture population are, are kind of cleaning up and removing all the food you add in, early on because of their kind of low uh, starting point, you have the jackal population doing a lot of the kind of heavy lifting, followed by the hyena, hyena population, and then both of these rates 10 to zero, which represents their exclusion uh, from the scavenging community. Uh, the lion population have a little early blip, but not really much to speak of. Uh, and so I will maybe um, skip ahead here. I've kind of uh, waffled a bit more than I would have expected expected to um, at this point. Uh, so we did essentially kind of numerical sensitivity analysis. We focused on the mammalian carrying capacities. And the reason we did that is because, as I said earlier, there's huge uncertainty in terms of how much are kind of existing mammal populations exploiting carcasses. It's quite hard to figure out really good dietary information and, and pinpoint it. So if it turns out that the densities we used were kind of associated with a very high uh, percentage of current exploitation. It means that we can't just kind of bolt on lots of extra um, uh, uptake of carcasses. It means that they were already kind of using this up so that the real current capacity was much lower than we thought. Uh, so we looked at that. That was kind of the main, the main area of uncertainty that we kind of were kind of fearful of. And so uh, in doing that, then we have to the carrying capacities and therefore the initial the starting points of the hyenas, the lions, the jackals. In this case, you see that the um, jackal population still does most of the work early on, but now the hyena population hasn't really had a chance to take over in the same way. And that is effectively 
explained in terms of the life history. So the jackals are kind of um, almost kind of like dog sized. They kind of they, re they reproduce and they die off uh, reasonably quickly compared to the much larger hyenas or the lions for that matter. So if you depress their population to start off with, it means that there is a, a kind of gap that needs to be made up. So the reproduction uh, kicks in and it, it will ultimately lead to the hyenas uh, converting, eating this food and converting it into new hyenas, uh, but they've kind of been disadvantaged and, and effectively they're in a race against the clock against this vulture population, which by about year 10 here has completely taken over as the dominant scavenger. So if it turns out that we were wrong in our carrying capacity estimates or wrong about the proportions of diet that's taken up by scavenging, then we kind of have this sort of answer here in that the jackal population I guess much like the dog population in India will essentially behave in the same way, but the hyena population, while a sort of better scavenger in the sense of it's, it's better equipped to find food, it doesn't really have enough time to do to do a lot with it. So the vulture population is at a low base, but still, if you give it about 10 years, it appears as though at Kruger, without extra disturbances kind of pulling them back down, they will supplant the mammal populations, um, whatever sizes they may be. And it is essentially a matter of time before they move towards that single stable state. Um, and so I was going to go a little bit more into kind of the analysis of this. Effectively, um, we saw this numerically. Uh, we then wanted to have a little bit of a better understanding of what happens both in this kind of first decade and in the kind of longer term where the mammals have become effectively irrelevant. And it's basically vultures versus carcasses and, and you kind of you don't have much else of interest in the system. And so uh, I'll kind of spare you the details um, now, but what we did essentially was we scaled the system uh, suitably for the first 10 years. We studied that and we kind of got some insight into the sort of the drivers of this transient behavior. And we scaled the system separately for um, the, the later times. Uh, and so when I say scale here, I mean non-dimensionalized. So a way of, of uh, figuring out which parts of the model are, are kind of dominant for this set of parameter values. So it's quite a useful tool when in this case, we're fairly sure about our parameterization and the kind of contents of our model. Um, and so kind of speeding through here a little bit, um, you may be better off kind of not seeing some of these scalings and, um, and, and more reams of equations. Uh, but the kind of the idea here is that we can kind of explain somewhat systematically how uh, the kind of this uncertainty about the the in, the densities of the mammal population is particularly important for hyenas. So we have a kind of sense of time, uh, a, a sense of how long it will take for the vulture population to kind of reign supreme here. And that's kind of uh, from the hyenas point of view, kind of uncomfortably close to how long it takes uh, roughly to kind of increase your hyena population. So they're, they're also quite long lived as compared to uh, a jackal. And then separately, we're able to look at later times and instead of having kind of a sort of effective three dimensional dynamical system with jackal, hyena and carrion, you have a two dimensional system where it's just vultures and just carrion. And so from there then, again, we rewrite our uh, system of differential equations uh, in a way that respects that you're reasonably near equilibrium and so that you can kind of um, essentially show that the mammals are no longer relevant in terms of um, the sort of drivers of carrion dynamics and therefore vulture dynamics. And so uh, when you do this, you end up uh, after a kind of series of simplifications with a set of two equations uh, they work on two different timescales. So the carcass timescale is much, much quicker, uh, kind of daily timescale compared to the vulture timescale, which is over, um, I believe, uh, five or six years is the kind of approximation. Um, and when you combine these, you end up with kind of master equation that tells you how the vultures behave when they are near equilibrium. And so you end up with a linear differential equation that you can solve uh, exactly. And so when you do that, um, you end up with, for the parameter values that we're happy with, 10 vultures per kilometer squared. Um, can't remember exactly where I rounded that, but it is 
really close to the 9.9 .9 that we got from our numerics. And this, this basically says that the only thing that's really happening as you get towards equilibrium is you're shoveling some food into the system and it's immediately converted or uh, stored away to be converted into a new vulture down the way. Nobody else gets a look in, no food is wasted. And for that reason, you end up with a really, really simple dynamical structure and, uh, and a kind of solvable equation uh, to go with it. And so when you have a, a formula for this, you can also look at how long it takes to reach this equilibrium. And again, we used to kind of sub in parameter values and um, you specify how close you want to get to the equilibrium because it's exponential growth, you'll never actually get there. If you say I want to get 95% of my upper limit, it will take you approximately 36 years. And so kind of going back to our numerics here, it means that we're essentially able to estimate analytically, um, kind of analytic approximation, that you spend about 10 years early on with mammals contributing to the removal of carcasses. And then once you're kind of past that, um, there's a kind of dichotomy where you only really have vultures um, really changing, vultures and carrion. And so from there, if you add on another 35 or 36 years, you're pretty much at your upper limit. And so this gives you some sense of kind of what's determining uh, the, the upper limits and what's determining the length of time spent in these various dynamical regimes. Um, and then in conclusion, very quickly, the pristine ecosystem we started off with turned out to still be very disturbed in that you're so, so far below your potential uh, vulture population. But positively, there is apparently a, a clear route to recovery for vultures if left to their own devices. In terms of the mammals, you can kind of pick up some quite interesting behavior where the jackals and the hyenas despite being completely outgunned by the vultures, are competing amongst themselves for carcasses for a period of time. Uh, lions, for, for our purposes, were essentially in irrelevance, but in reality, it is quite likely that instead of just finding carcasses um, kind of uh, as a sort of passive search, they may be kind of finding hyena, hyenas or jackals at a carcass and shooing them away effectively. So, so stealing other people's kills, and that would sort of alter the picture we had. But um, uh, in a way that a mechanistic model would hopefully um, account for. And then that we don't have any long transients. This is a kind of a kind of in vogue term where you, you are very, very far from equilibrium and you have a kind of range of behavior that you, you kind of uncover numerically. So that would that would be where you have dozens of generations of kind of mammals ruling the system here, though, um, probably thankfully, Vultures just need a couple of generations, it seems, to supplant the mammals that may be causing disease in a kind of real world um, system. So, over, uh, so for conservation purposes, I guess if you're worried about lots of hyenas or jackals or lions um, running around, it's, it's happening for about 10 years before they kind of get excluded and ultimately die off. Uh, so it's of importance for conservation, um, but maybe not fulfilling this kind of more uh, theoretical description of what a long transient is. Um, and so that's it. So thank you for your attention and um, delighted to take any questions.